Welcome to Full Spectrum Science. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the science of big and small. Big things are not just scaled up versions of small things, or vice versa. In spite of all the science fiction you've seen, you can't make a spider as big as a dinosaur. There are biological reasons this won't work, and there are engineering reasons this won't work. And the reasoning all goes back at least 400 years to something called the square cube law. Now, this sounds something like a geometry problem, and it is, partially. In 1638, Galileo published Discourses and Mathematical Demonstrations Relating to Two New Sciences. In this book, he describes the square cube law as the ratio of two volumes is greater than the ratio of their surfaces. Fleshed out a bit more, we can describe this law like this. As any three-dimensional object increases in size without any change in proportion, the surface area will increase as the square of the linear measurement, and the volume will increase as the cube of the linear measurement. Well, this still isn't very clear, so let's look at this with some demonstrations. Let's start with a cube with a dimension of one. This could be inches or meters or even furlongs. It doesn't matter at this point. The length is one, the width is one, and the height is one. With the length of the side equal to one, the area of each side is one times one, or one square unit. And the volume of the cube is one times one times one, or one unit in volume. Let's double the size of our original cube. We can build our double size cube with one unit cubes. We now have a cube with a length of two units, a width of two units, and a height of two units. With the length of the side equal to two, the area of each side is two times two, or four square units. And the volume of the cube is two times two times two, or eight units in volume. You saw all eight drop in when we created this bigger cube. The size doubled. The surface area got bigger by a factor of four, or two squared. And the volume increased by a factor of eight, or two cubed. Notice that the volume is growing faster than the surface area. Let's do another one. This time, let's build a triple-sized cube. Again, we'll build it out of one-unit cubes. The bottom layer takes nine little cubes, three by three. And then we need two more layers, just like the first layer. We now have a cube with a length of three units, a width of three units, and a height of three units. With the length of the side equal to three, the area of each side is three by three, or nine square units. And the volume of the cube is three by three by three, or 27 units in volume. The size tripled compared to our one unit cube. The surface area got bigger by a factor of nine, or three squared, and the volume increased by a factor of 27, or three cubed. Notice that the volume is still growing faster than the surface area. We could continue building cubes, but let's just put up a spreadsheet showing the growth in size, area, and volume. The same numbers work for any shape, not just cubes. When you think of it, you can make almost any shape out of cubes, as the Minecraft enthusiasts out there know. Even an elephant to make an accurate elephant, you just need to use smaller and smaller cubes, but the math stays the same. If we graph the relationships of the sizes, areas, and volumes, this is what it looks like. Again, surface area grows by the square of the size, and the volume grows by the cube of the size. The volume will always outstrip the area, since it's growing much faster. This is important for many engineering and biological reasons, as we'll see. 
For instance, the Airbus 380 has lift and control services, wings, rudders, and elevators, that are relatively big compared to the fuselage of the airplane. Taking the smaller Boeing 737 and merely magnifying its dimensions to the size of an A380 would result in wings too small for the aircraft weight, because the weight of the aircraft grows as the cube of its size, and the wing area only grows as the square of the aircraft size, the square cube law. Also note that you need twice the engines on the A380 to get it into the air. Here's a good bioengineering example. A human femur has evolved to support an average human's weight. It has a certain diameter and a cross-sectional area related to that diameter. That area must support the weight of the human it belongs to. If we double the size of the femur, its length, width, and depth all double. The cross-sectional area grows by a factor of 2 by 2, or 4. But here's the problem. The volume, and hence the weight of the femur and the enclosing human, has grown by a factor of 2 times 2 times 2, or 8 times. That means that every square inch of the support area must now carry twice the load of the smaller bone. It's highly likely that any sudden motion tripping or jumping, is likely to break that bone. Further increase in size just makes the situation worse. It works in the opposite direction, too. Ants, like this leafcutter ant, can carry 100 times their own weight. Humans, if they're in good shape, can lift uh, about their own weight. A horse can't even carry another horse of its own weight. To support the extra weight that comes with bigger size, the diameter of tree trunks in larger trees must become more stout compared with the rest of the tree. What goes for tree trunks goes for dinosaur bones. As the size of the dinosaur increases, the bones must get much stockier to support all that extra weight. Check out these dinosaur leg bones. Pretty impressive. The largest mammal alive today is the blue whale. Here we have a different case, though. The skeleton of a whale, or any creature in the water, does not have to support its weight. That's accomplished by buoyancy. Here, the skeleton is only responsible for maintaining the shape of the animal and providing a framework for the muscles to work together. The blue whale is up to 98 feet long, weighing 200 tons. It's not practical to have land animals that have to deal with gravity growing as large as the blue whale. On the other side, the smallest mammals are the Etruscan shrew, weighing only 1.8 grams, or about a sixteenth of an ounce, and the bee hummingbird, also at 1.8 grams. These animals have some different issues because of their tiny nature. We'll get into that in a moment. The very largest land mammal was the now extinct Paraceratherium, a form of rhinoceros, truly gigantic compared to modern rhinos, and very large compared to a human. And of course, there were the larger dinosaurs, longer than the blue whale, but half its weight. Let's compare a couple very common land mammals, the field mouse, and the African elephant. The elephant is about 53 times the height of the mouse. It's therefore about 53 times 53 times 53, or 150,000 times as heavy. That gives the elephant thick, stumpy legs and very flat feet. What's interesting here is that the elephant has 53 times 53, or about 2,800 times the surface area. Does this have some consequence? Each square inch of the elephant's skin must get rid of 53 times the heat as the same square inch of mouse skin. The amount of heat produced by the chemical reactions within a body depends on the weight of the tissue, which in turn depends on its volume. The rate at which such heat is lost depends on the surface area of the body, 
roughly speaking. This means that the larger the animal, the more heat it retains, since the production rises faster than the loss. In general, then, all other things being equal, a small animal must have a faster metabolism than a large one if it's to replace the more quickly leaking energy. A mouse must be constantly eating and will die of starvation in a matter of hours, while a large animal can last for long periods. An animal's proportions, the shape of its legs and its wings, for example, are conditioned by its size and would be all wrong if that size were changed without an appropriate change in other proportions. Remember, the elephant has 150,000 times the heat-generating tissue, but only 2,800 times the surface area to radiate away this heat. Each square inch of the elephant must get rid of 53 times the heat as the same square inch of mouse skin. An elephant, therefore, is naked and has giant floppy ears to help transfer heat out. The mouse has the opposite problem. It has insulating fur to help keep the heat in. What about getting enough oxygen? Tiny insects are ventilated by small tubes in the abdomen where ordinary diffusion of oxygen is just about enough for the creature's needs. The oxygen just comes in and goes out all on its own. Expand an insect to the size of a man without utterly changing its respiratory system and it would asphyxiate at once. Indeed, nothing would be as utterly helpless, harmless, and dead as that great science fiction menace, the giant insect. More on that in a bit. For larger creatures, simple tubes penetrating into the body won't do. They don't have enough surface area to collect enough oxygen. Fish have evolved gills, seen here in red, with crinkly, feathery surfaces to expand the surface area in contact with water. This allows the fish to extract enough oxygen to supply the fish. Larger fish might have a total gill area of 10 square feet or more. We need even more complicated structures to increase the surface area of our lungs. They're broken up into about 600 million tiny little chambers called alveoli. Each alveolus is about eight thousandths of an inch in diameter, barely visible to the naked eye. If you could lay out flat all the alveoli, the total surface of all those tiny chambers adds up to at least 600 square feet. In the same way, the quantity of blood to be filtered depends on the weight and hence the volume of the animal. The rate at which it can be filtered depends on the surface area available in the kidney. For that reason, the human kidney is broken up into over a million little tubes and their total length in both kidneys comes to about 40 miles. Every creature also needs to absorb nutrients into its body. In the earthworm, a simple tube along the length of its body has enough surface area to absorb the food it needs for its small body mass, but increase the size and hence the volume and things get a bit more complicated. In a human, the tube or intestines are 15 feet long and are folded and coiled into our abdomen. A simple straight through tube doesn't have the surface area necessary but even stuffing more tube inside us isn't good enough. The inside walls of the intestines themselves are folded, and then those folds are folded further into a velvety surface. These are called villi. The villi themselves are also folded and covered in microvilli. If you could measure the total area of our intestines, the area needed to absorb the necessary nutrition, it would be about 350 square feet, or the size of a studio apartment. We're not big because we're complicated. We're complicated because we're big. And of course, because of the square cube law. But let's talk a bit about how science fiction handles big and small. 
in the TV series Land of the Giants and the similarly sized woman in Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, we have creatures about 12 times their original size, with 144 times the surface area and 1,728 times the weight, or about 150 tons. What would standing feel like to these folk? Suppose you place 42 pounds, 12 times the normal force, on each square inch of your soles. Each foot would be supporting one ton. That would drop you to the floor and crush you to death under your own weight. Beached whales are crushed by their own weight and die like this. Never mind the fact that our giant's lungs, intestines, and kidneys aren't up to the task of keeping them alive either. Godzilla first released in 1954 in Japan, was one of the first giant monsters. At least his legs were very stout. But if he was originally born in water, it's doubtful he would have evolved those legs for land use. King Kong even got into the act in 1962's King Kong vs. Godzilla. Since Kong hasn't changed his proportions, he couldn't survive, let alone stand up. In this scene, Godzilla is obviously playing dirty. Godzilla has gone through many evolutions since 1954. Originally, he was only 160 feet tall. By 1995, Godzilla would double in size and get eight times heavier. Currently, Godzilla has reached a height of almost 390 feet. But let's move on to other giants of the silver screen. The original movie version of Jules Verne's novel, Mysterious Island, was produced in 1961 and featured a dazzling array of impossibly large creatures animated by Ray Harryhausen with a fantastic musical score by my favorite movie composer, Bernard Herrmann. One of the animals they encounter is a giant crab. The original crab, again stop animated by Ray Harryhausen, was a normal-sized crab mounted on an animation armature built by Harryhausen's father. Two other crabs were filmed alive to get the motion of their mandibles right. All three crabs were consumed by the crew and not wasted. Again, it's doubtful that this crab would have the strength to stand, let alone the respiratory and circulatory systems to survive. Spoiler alert! Don't worry, the fellow in the crab's claw, Neb, is rescued and, miraculously, looks no worse for the wear. But wait, there's more. The creature that really got to me as a kid was the giant bee. We have the same problem with this giant beast that we have with the others. The skeleton, or in this case the exoskeleton, wouldn't support the much increased mass of the bee, nor would its designed for small size biological systems. One extra issue here is that the wings you see are far too small to let this creature fly. Can't stand, walk, fly, or survive. Not much of a threat, really. Of course, large insects play an outsized role, if you'll excuse the pun, in science fiction. There are the giant, and impossible, ants in them. And of course, no review of giant insects would be complete with the very often used arachnophobia-inducing spiders. Here's an actual daddy long legs. Can you imagine this blown up to elephant size? This poor little delicate spider would be crushed under its own weight. No way those legs could support it, even eight of them. One of my favorite films was 1955's It Came From Beneath the Sea, another classic Ray Harryhausen stop animation. This movie has a wonderful local San Francisco flavor. The explosion of the first hydrogen bomb in the Pacific has interesting effects on nearby sea creatures. Here, our favorite cephalopod attacks and tears down part of the Golden Gate Bridge. Of course, this was our fault by shocking it with high voltage nets below the water. 
What do we expect the poor creature to do? I'm not sure how you can have electrified nets under conductive salt water. That's why maybe you should hire science consultants to help you with your movie. That's one strong octopus. In a later part of the movie, the octopus attacks the Exploratorium's neighborhood along the Embarcadero, terrorizing the locals. The acting in this segment is somewhat questionable, but this was way back before actors had much experience with green screens and virtual sets. This is very low tech by today's standards, but in 1955, it was state of the art. I should mention that due to the tight budget on this film and the difficulty of animating eight arms, Ray Harryhausen was only allowed to have an octopus with six tentacles. So technically, this is a hexapus, not an octopus. Many of the scenes show only one tentacle. Uh-oh. This doesn't look good for the ferry building. Good thing it's only a beautiful model of the ferry building that gets torn down here. If you've ever seen a real octopus, a normal sized one out of water, they can barely lift an arm, like this poor fellow escaping from a fishing boat. Look how flat it is out of water. I don't see this pulling down a bridge or a building. Don't worry, this has a happy ending. We've been talking about things getting big. How about getting small? In 1957's The Incredible Shrinking Man, our hero was shrinking for some unknown mysterious reason. Note that in 1957, this film cautions that it is not suitable for children. It was a simpler time. There are so many problems with this film, many of which we've already discussed. I just wanted to bring up the issue with this frame. While he's holding on what to us would be a normal nail, to our hero, this nail would be about five feet long and about five inches in diameter. That would be slightly over a thousand cubic inches in volume to him. Knowing the density of steel, I calculate that that nail should weigh close to 300 pounds at his scale. I doubt that he could hold that nail in that position, given that fact. As long as one doesn't go to extremes in scale, Hollywood has been known to do an adequate job with scaling. In this short movie, Laurel and Hardy in the film Bratz, the actors are maybe one-third or one-half the size of a full human, and things work pretty well. 
I'm sure the set designers and builders had a great time building the props and furniture for this movie. But again, building things bigger, they had to take into account the increased mass and lower strength of their building materials. The only minor quibble is that body proportions change as one goes from infant to toddler to child to adult, and Laurel and Hardy are adult proportioned. The last movie I'll talk about is another favorite of mine, Fantastic Voyage. This 1966 film miniaturized a submarine with its crew to do a critical operation on the brain of an important scientist from the inside, apparently the only option. The sub, the Proteus, was reduced to a size somewhat larger than a red blood cell, about six to eight microns in diameter, or to around one ten millionth of their original size. There's only a few ways to do this. One, you could push atoms closer together, but this means there would be the same number of atoms after as before. The weight would remain the same. A sub the size of a blood cell would be so dense that it would fall through the floor and sink to the center of the earth. Let's rule out that method. Two, you could remove atoms. Assuming you could remove atoms uniformly, you could no longer support complex life. Just imagine leaving only one ten millionth of your DNA in place, or your brain so that won't work. Three, our last option is to reduce the size of the atoms along with their mass. This would be very difficult too. You'd have to change all that removed mass to energy and somehow get rid of that energy. The largest hydrogen bomb ever detonated only converted five pounds of matter into energy. You'd have to get rid of thousands of hydrogen bombs worth of energy. But this is science fiction, so we'll just go with this method. The sub was then injected into the carotid artery headed to the brain. The patient was kept cooled to minimize thermal agitation. More on this in a bit. The sub only stays miniaturized for 60 minutes. The little antennas are to provide radio communication with the sub but the sub's radio frequency would be shifted up by a factor of 10 million, so they'd be communicating with light as far as the outside world was concerned. You might think that the injection turbulence would utterly destroy the Proteus, but here their size offers some protection. They have so little inertia, they'd hardly feel it. I love this scene, traveling down the hypodermic needle. And? Into the bloodstream. The lava lamp-like lead red, oh. Okay, we're gonna try that again. The sub was then injected into the carotid artery, headed to the brain. The patient was kept cooled to minimize thermal agitation. More on this in a bit. The sub only stays miniaturized for 60 minutes. Those little antennas are to provide radio communication with the sub but the sub's radio frequency would be shifted up by a factor of 10 million. So they'd be communicating with light as far as the outside world was concerned. Inject. 
Check. Tracking post. You might think that the injection turbulence would utterly destroy the Proteus. But here, their size offers some protection. They have so little inertia, they'd hardly feel it. I love this scene, traveling down the hypodermic needle. and eventually into the bloodstream. The lava lamp-like red blood cells are very nice, though red blood cells are much firmer but we have a different problem that the movie totally ignores, the kinetic theory of heat. What you see here are tiny droplets of oil suspended in water. The oil droplets are about the same size as the Proteus. All molecules above absolute zero in temperature are in motion. You can't see the water molecules here. They're way too small but you can see the effect they have on the oil droplets as they continually collide with them, batting them around. This was first observed by Scottish botanist Robert Brown, as he observed suspended pollen grains in water. This is now called Brownian motion. The Proteus would also be subject to this bombardment, providing for a very rough ride. Because of sabotage, our crew needs to replenish the sub's air supply. Good thing they accidentally ended up in the lungs. Several problems here, though. As we'll see in a moment, the wispy cell wall they penetrate to enter the lung would actually be 40 yards thick at their scale. Also, our aquanauts have been reduced in size, but not the water molecules they're swimming in. These water molecules would be the size of BBs. Remember Brownian motion? At room temperature, water molecules are moving over 2,000 feet per second, or twice the speed of sound. That's the same as a high-speed bullet. To our reduced size aquanauts, this would seem even faster since their distance scale is reduced by a factor of 10 million. Getting hit constantly by many thousands of these would be uncomfortable to say the least. Also, the snorkel would need to have a miniaturization device to make the BB-sized air molecules small enough for them to breathe. They'd also have to spend a lot of time in the lung to collect enough atoms to refill their tanks. Way more time than the 60 minutes they had. By the way, from all the carbon particles you see scattered around, you can tell that the scientist patient was a smoker. Aside from the cell membrane being 40 yards thick to the crew, surface tension of the water-air interface would have been an impenetrable barrier. Surface tension. The forces at the surface of the water are very powerful. It can support water striders, which are thousands of times bigger than the Proteus or its crew. Surface tension can even support a steel paper clip. No way our swimmers could break through that surface unless they brought along some soap or other surfactant that would reduce the surface tension. We'll just assume they had some in their toolbox in anticipation of this. The movie mentions nothing about this problem. Spoiler alert! Well, you've had 55 years to see this movie. I'm not going to feel guilty now. At the end of the movie, finally, in the brain, the saboteur is trapped in the Proteus as it's attacked by a white blood cell.
both sub and saboteur are consumed. Our heroes escape along the optic nerve to the corner of the eye and are extracted in a tear. All is well. Or is it? Remember they left the saboteur and the sub behind in the brain of the rescued scientist. Wouldn't that also expand back to normal size when their 60 minutes is up? But the sub was eaten by the white blood cell, I hear you say. Well, that doesn't change a thing. The atoms making up the sub and the saboteur are still inside the scientist's head. When they grow to normal size, they'd cause quite a large headache and explosion. Again, not dealt with in the movie. Isaac Asimov wrote the novelization of the movie and properly dealt with many of these issues. In the end, he has the crew stimulate the white blood cell to chase them to the eye so that it too could be properly removed. At least in the book, all is well. I'd like to leave you with a couple of references. About 300 years after Galileo, J.B.S. Haldane published a wonderful essay on being the right size, detailing some of the consequences of the square cube law. I encourage you to download this short paper from the Internet Archive and enjoy it. Another great work on size and scale, called On Growth and Form, was written by Darcy Wentworth Thompson in 1917. It's much more detailed than Haldane's popular paper and runs over 1,100 pages. In spite of its length, it's stuffed with interesting size and scale comparisons. By the way, Thompson was often accompanied by his pet African gray parrot named Polly, who probably also appears in this photo too. You can get this book from the Internet Archive as well. Thank you for listening to Full Spectrum Science, Big and Small. This has been Full Spectrum Science with Ron Hipschman, brought to you by the Exploratorium in San Francisco. This program, like all Exploratorium programs, is only possible because of donors like you. We know that this time is challenging, but if you can, help us keep educational content like this free and accessible to all by donating today at www.exploratorium.edu give. Thank you.